Well, hello there and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum, and we're getting into another segment of aircraft in our inventory. But first, we are going to do something a little fun, Greg. We're actually going to do a little bit different hat routine here. It's going to be like, there we go. Greg, did you notice that movement? All one movement. There we go. What do you think, Greg? Is it me? There you go. Well, there I am. I, I went a different way on the hat today. Greg has stepped it up. He is my sententious assistant, my sententious assistant. And today we are wearing the top hat because I don't know why, Greg. You've chosen the top hat, but there's got to be a reason why. Oh, the jump jet. Therefore, the hat jumps. He gave me the signs. Greg is a, a good mime. We're going to toss that off camera. Today we're going to be talking about the McDonnell Douglas, the AV-8B, the Harrier II. This is also a unique aircraft design because it was originally started by Hawker and then it was picked up by McDonnell Douglas and British Aerospace is in there. And so it's kind of a design that just went through a lot of evolution. Now the interesting thing about this particular artifact behind me is, Greg, it is a movie star. It is a movie star. Do you know what film? It, it's actually been in a couple of different films, but the movie star film that it is most known for, it's True Lies, Greg. It's get out of the chopper and get into the Harrier jet, Greg. You've got to get into the jet. But no, it was uh, Arnold, actually, his rump was in this seat, Greg, was in this seat for True Lies. The film True Lies, that's where it kind of cut its teeth, but we're going to, uh, and in that movie, I must say, if you remember the film, what the Harrier did with the guy walking around on the top of it, and then he gets launched with a missile and all that other stuff, we can't do any of that because there's a copyright strike if we did do that, Greg. But the, uh, it, it was actually pretty comical because there's no way any of that would happen. But this is the front end of that jet that was used in the filming. Now, the concept of the Harrier is unique. And really, what is it? Well, we've talked about attack helicopters, right? And helicopters come in, they have all this ordnance, and they can bomb, and they can strafe, and they can do all kinds of stuff to get to put the enemy's head down. But, but they're not incredibly fast. And so the idea was, if you could get a jet, a jump jet, Greg, you like that? I worked it in there, a jump jet, you could uh, get something that was faster, could carry more ordnance. It could be dangerous to other jets because it could carry air-to-air -air missiles. It could do air-to-ground. So the Harrier, the AV-8B, the Harrier II, actually was just under subsonic. It could do Mach 0.09, so it was uh, just slightly under the speed of sound. It could go about 675 miles an hour. Now, in the early days when they were practicing with the jump jet, and I'm gonna, we don't have a Harrier, so we're gonna go to the next generation, because this is the next generation jump jet. Now, the, we can throw up a plan view of the Harrier. Greg can throw one up. And what we should do, Greg, is in our graphic, let's throw up a, some variants, and we're not gonna get into all of them, but the idea was uh, you had thrust nozzles on the side of the airplane that could point down, in this case, this nozzle in the back points down, and the airplane can essentially lift off vertically, jump jet, and then transition to horizontal flight. And it can be, as I said, fairly quick. Now, in the original aircraft, there were Pegasus engines, but the idea was that you essentially, you had a fighter. Now, in practicality, there were problems. When you lift it off vertically, the early aircraft did not have a very good payload. In fact, that was one of the barriers that was a challenge for the United States military because the Navy, Greg, had already had an attack aircraft, the Skyhawk, the A-4 Skyhawk. The, the early Harriers can only carry about half of the payload of the Skyhawk, so they were not very attractive. It wasn't until later under the AV-8B designation, which the first prototype flew as the YAV-8B in 1979. That's a mouthful, Greg. 
the YAV-8B. That flew in 1979, and the actual prototype or the production version of the Harrier, the AV-8B, flew in 1981. Now, one of the barriers, though, was, and it wasn't until they upengined the airplane uh, under McDonnell Douglas, and basically the McDonnell Douglas design was a complete redesign of the Harrier. So we have a, an a aircraft that we'll talk a little bit about under British, uh, what the British did with it, with the RAF and the Royal Navy, and then the primarily the Marines. The Navy did not want this airplane, and in a couple of different instances, tried to kill it. Uh, in the late 70s and the early 80s, but ultimately the Marines uh, won out with the airplane because they needed a ground attack airplane. And so it entered service in 1985, the AV-8B Harrier, which is the, I would say the American, although it was built under license, the American version of the airplane. But uh, the early versions really cut their teeth in what war, Craig? The Falkland Islands. Now, the Royal Navy had made a decision, and that was that as they integrated into NATO, the Royal Navy would be more of an anti-submarine force and an um, interdiction force, and the air cover, the primary air cover, would be provided by the United States Navy and their big deck carriers, which were fielding true interceptors, and we've talked about the Phantom, the F-4 Phantom, and the F-14. The Royal Navy started to downsize as a cost-cutting measure, and what they did is they came up with those jump jet carriers. And the jump jet carriers, and Greg can throw one up, had that little whoop-de-doo off the, it looked like a skateboard ramp off the end of the carrier. And what would do is the carrier was so short that that, that little whoop-de-doo would give the jet a little more, and we've used this technical term before, umph, a little more umph to get off the deck. It would get off the deck a little higher and it would essentially jump into the air. It could take off vertically, but if it actually went off the carrier in a horizontal configuration, it could carry a, a heavier payload. And that was really what they did. Now, <clears throat> that was the practical nature of it. And that was uh, the Royal Navy thinking they were gonna fit into this overall NATO configuration. Then what happened? Argentina, invaded the Falkland Islands, and the British had to do, the sun never sets on the British Empire, right? And the Royal Navy, hundreds of years of tradition, has to go down and they have to fight in the Falkland Islands. Now they're fighting against uh, the uh, Argentine, the Air Force, the, Argent the Argentinians. They had a uh, Mirage, they had high-speed Mirage uh, aircraft, they had Super Eton darts, which launched the first cruise missiles, uh, they had A-4 Skyhawks, which we just talked about, which were dropping iron bombs. The British went down there with an amalgamation of carriers and cargo ships and uh, cruisers and all kinds of that kind of stuff. Well, they found out something pretty nasty. What did they find out, Greg? And this actually has impacted naval doctrine, and that was, remember, we talked about the F-14 last week and the need to have the ability to project power over the horizon. So when we got, when the British got into a fight in the uh, Falkland Islands, they soon learned two things. One was that these uh, super Etendards, and you know, I always screw up the pronunciation on that, so I may have screwed up the pron pronunciation, but essentially these bombers that were carrying these ship-killing missiles on them could fire the missile from over the horizon. And the British found that the Harriers, they couldn't provide enough of a combat air patrol to protect, protect their sea assets. They just could not do a good job. And the Harriers were flying off a combination of cargo ships that had been modified for jump jets. And then they were also flying off their dedicated carriers with these whoop de doo carriers. It's a technical term, Greg, whoop de doo And so, and they were trying to fly a traditional cap. What they found out was that on the long-range bombers, uh, or long-range cruise missile launch uh, aircraft that the, that the Argentinians had could hit the, and they lost a number of ships to these, uh, these anti-ship missiles. This was really the first time that uh, 
uh, anti-ship missiles like a harpoon or those types of missiles had been used. In this case, it was a French Exocet missile. Greg can throw up one of those. But they fired those over the horizon at the British ships. Now, there were two things. We talked about the cap didn't work for the British. They had a very hard time, and I'm not bagging on the Royal Navy, so don't throw me the hate mail on the Royal Navy. They, they, they fought incredibly well under very difficult conditions. But like many times, we've talked about a lot of the assumption of the hardware and even the American aircraft that we talked about. The designers made an assumption, and then when you put the aircraft in the field, guess what happened? Didn't work. It just completely didn't work. And in this case, the British could not rely on the uh, bigger American carriers that the fleet had been uh, kind of tucked into. And so they didn't have air superiority that they would like to protect their capital ships. And when you're trying to project power and they were going to invade the Falkland Islands, they have to control the airspace. So these Exocet missiles did a lot of damage to the British uh, fleet. The other thing that they found out was, and this is a history lesson for Greg. Greg is enjoying this. He's now gotten a cup of coffee and a chair and sat down. The other thing that the British realized was that the Exocets from the time that the missile broke the horizon till the time it struck the ship. And this again has to do with your combat air patrol that the British countermeasures on the ships could not lock on to the missile. And so what ended up happening was their anti-missile defense coupled with not being able to project a combat air patrol meant that they were incredibly vulnerable. And the uh, Exocet missiles, when they hit the ships, they also found something else bad. Do you know what that was, Greg? The unspent fuel in the missiles detonated in the ship. So not only did they have a warhead detonation, but the unspent fuel detonated in the ship. It caused massive fires, and a lot of their ships were built out of aluminum. And what does aluminum do, Greg? It burns. So trying to put out a, literally the fire on the, the, the metal on the ship is on fire. They're trying to put this out. The, uh, they had a really tough time. Ultimately, they prevailed. And I don't, I, at some point, maybe we can do a video about the actual air war over the Falkland Islands, because it is, it actually impacts a lot of designers' thoughts. But the reality of the situation was um, that the British hung in there but the Argentinians gave them a really tough fight. And they also proved that you could not rely on the jump jet, this early Harrier version, to be able to provide fleet security. It didn't work. Even though they had pretty good missiles and they, they had excellent seamanship and, and ex excellent tactical deployment of their assets, they still could not protect their, their ships. That is what now we're going to go all the way around the horn. That's what impacted the United States Navy and why the Navy really did not want this airplane. They, they looked at that and went, yeah, we don't think that's a good idea. Planners, uh, the airplane was already in development at that time. But as I said, a couple of times the Navy um, um, took a shot at it and decided that they were trying to get rid of the program. Fortunately, the Marines, the Marines, the United States Marine Corps, Semper Fi, the United States Marines uh, were able to win out. And at the end of the day, they made the argument that the United States operates two different types of carriers, Greg, and we've talked about them. In this case now, all, we used to have distillate carriers, right, that ran on conventional fuel. They're all Nimitz class carriers now, but big deck carriers. We also uh, operate uh, a mid-range carrier that is essentially, uh, these now are like helicopter carriers and they're also amphi amphibious assault ships. So they provide, in context, in terms of size, they're about the size of a World War II class carrier. And we're not gonna get into uh, deep into the class of them. But what ended up happening is the Marines were saying, well, wait a minute, if our primary mission is to take the beach, right, is to do amphibious landings, we need the most firepower that we can bring to bear. And so rather than just relying on helicopters, which again, are kind of slow, 
Uh, we want something that's faster and that can also give us another dimension that over the beach, not for the fleet, but over the beach, they can provide a combat air patrol. So if they're armed with Sidewinder missiles, as an example, they can project that power. That is where the AV-8B, Greg, came into play. Now, if I'm gonna jump over here, I'm gonna put this down. We'll talk about this in a minute a little more. And we're gonna go to our stage two today, Greg. Now, our stage two, oh, Jones, a very familiar suspect, uh, cane sugar soda. Now this has, if we were taking the beach, it has a very nice beach scene on there, Greg. Uh, it is, uh, this is a watermelon soda. Again, Jones has been independent since 1986. They are not a sponsor of this program. But if you are a close air support driver and you were flying for the United States Marine Corps, the AV-8B, the Harrier II, I want to salute you. That's a tough job. You have to have a lot of skill because you have to not only be able to take off horizontally, but take off and land vertically. That's not easy. And so I want to salute you. We're going to go ahead and pop the top on this. There did sound like there was a little carbonation, so there may not be a poisoning incident in my future. Greg is watching me intently. Again, if you're a Harrier driver uh, and you're out doing that work and you're in the United States Marine Corps, Semper Fi, God bless you, cheers. A little tart, a little tart watermelon, but not terrible. It has a little bouquet to it, not, not too bad, Greg. I'm becoming a connoisseur of absolutely awful soda. But uh, we're going to salute you again. Another shot. Jones Cane Sugar Soda. Let's see, uh, 120 calories. So this one's not too bad. Um, this is not my taste, but it is not the vile gruel you've been serving me in the last uh, two weeks. So I don't know if gruel qualifies as soda, but uh, we'll, we'll go with that. So the, um, the Harrier, the uh, AV-8B, the Harrier II, uh, was introduced in 1985. There were 337 of them made, not widely produced. That's not a huge production. Again, pretty much uh, supplanted the, uh, the uh, A4s and some of the other things that were in the, in the, uh, in the inventory and, and were being flown by the Marines and the Navy at that time. The first prototype of this airplane was a P-1127. That was the British version. Now, the interesting thing, and I am holding an F-35 in my hand here, is that uh, they've continued to stick with this jump jet variation uh, with a single nozzle. You know, so you have a, a, a single nozzle in the back. We're headed away from the naval doctrine in a long time was two engines you know, the F-18, F-14, but we're going the single nozzle with, uh, with being able to vector thrust underneath. This aircraft obviously is much more stealthy and these later engines in these, uh, in these newer jets uh, dr dr develop tremendous amount more thrust. So this actually could be a fighter aircraft and a fighter bomber that, you know, could give the enemy uh, a, quite a difficult time. Now, the, the uh, Harrier was upgraded both in weapon systems and avionics throughout its career. It is now being replaced, uh, and they think that the last AV-8B squadrons will leave military service in the United States Marine Corps in 2025, if you can believe that, Greg. So they're, they're almost headed out of the inventory but they are a truly, truly unique design and a unique airplane. And one, as I said, that, that has an interesting history and, and has gone through its paces. It's been combat tested. These airplanes, uh, these variants have seen combat. And, uh, it, but it's one of those things that probably this particular iteration when you're going to the F-35 and you're talking about this Harrier, it, it's reached the end of its line as far as how much it can be modified. There's only so much you can do with an airframe and they've done about all they can. So if you at home want to have a puzzle 
that features. How cool are puzzles, Greg? Very cool. Greg builds puzzles all the time. This one has all kinds of, of interesting planes on it, including an early version of the Harrier. You can go out to our web store and pick this up. Jason will be happy to send this to you. He will run to the mailbox and throw it in the mailbox for you. But go out and get this puzzle. Now remember, we cannot do restorations on these aircraft and continue to maintain them unless you get us a donation and go out to our page, give us a donation. If you like this video, send it to your friends, subscribe to us on YouTube, like us on YouTube, like us on Facebook. We can always use the likes. And I want to thank you for joining us today. My name is Fred Bell. I'm the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Have a great day.